Hello and welcome. This is uh, Ilford High Road Baptist Church. We're glad that you found us or that you have come back and joined us again. That's uh, really good. Uh, we're continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark. And this week, Mark chapter 14, and uh, a woman who comes and anoints Jesus. And we're going to read together both from Mark 14 and also from John chapter 12. Our readings today come from Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. I'm going to start at verse 3. Jesus is anointed at Bethany. Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon, a man who had suffered a dreaded skin disease. While Jesus was eating, a woman came in with an alabaster jar full of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. Some of the people there became very angry and said to one another, what was the use of wasting the perfume? It could have been sold for more than 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor. And they criticized her harshly. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a fine and a beautiful thing for me. You will always have poor people with you, and any time you want to, you can help them. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body to prepare it ahead of time for burial. Now I assure you that whenever the gospel is preached all over the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. We're going to turn over to John's Gospel and we're going to read the account that John gives. Starting in chapter 12, verse 1. <coughs> Six days before the Passover, Jesus went to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from death. They prepared a dinner for him there, which Martha helped him to serve. Lazarus was one of those who was sitting at the table with Jesus when Mary took a litre of very expensive perfume made of pure nard, poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The sweet smell of the perfume filled the whole house. One of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, the one who was going to betray him, said, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would help himself from it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Let her keep what she has for the day of my burial. You will always have poor people with you, but you will not always have me. Perhaps it was the food, or maybe the after dinner speaker. Or then again, perhaps it was the company around the table where the host had seated you for the occasion. I wonder what was the most memorable wedding breakfast or 50th birthday party that you have attended? In our readings in Mark 14, it wasn't the food or even the conversation that was remembered most, but the actions of Mary. For a few weeks, as we have been reading in the Gospel of Mark, we have been walking with Jesus. That is, we've been listening to his teaching, we've watched his actions, we've observed how he responds to people, and we've noted what matters most to him. And we've been asking the question, will we walk as Jesus walked. Well, after all that we've seen and heard and learned from Jesus, today our question is a little different. How will we respond to Jesus? Will our response be like that of the tenants of the vineyard whom we read about a few weeks ago? Or like some of the Pharisees or like Judas in our passage today? Or will we be like the widow? in the temple that we read about two weeks ago, or Mary, this morning. This section in which Mary anoints him challenges us to make our response. What will it be? Mary breaks the jar of precious 
ointment. She pours it all out. She fills the room with its fragrance. How are you going to respond to Jesus today? Let's begin by seeing first how Mary broke the jar and explore the significance of that and ask the question, what jar or jars do do we need to break? Alabaster is made up of small, smooth grains of a a mineral called gypsum. It's a marble-like substance, it's often white in colour and was very often used to make ornamental objects. In this case, either a box or a jar. The Greek word is simply alabasteron, which means a thing made of alabaster. Some people think that it was maybe a small box with a a, a lid. But there's a question for me, if that's the case, why did she need to break the lid to get the oil out? Others think that it was maybe just a small jar, but with a long, thin neck and with a seal at the top. Such jars would often contain expensive perfume. And the long neck meant that you could tip the bottle very gently and just a few drops would come out. Now, Mary could have carefully undone the seal. She could have gently allowed a few drops to fall. But she didn't. Mary broke the neck on this bottle. She broke the neck of the jar so that she could pour out everything that she had to the Lord. And her breaking the jar is significant. I don't think that this is the brokenness of despair, the brokenness of a life that's in tatters or a feeling that we can't cope. The breaking here is really positive. It's done deliberately so that the oil can be poured out and the fragrance just fill the whole room. And so I think the significance of Mary breaking the jar is total devotion to the Lord. The dinner is being given in Jesus' honour. He's in the town of Bethany. Lazarus is present. Martha is helping to serve. And it's her sister Mary who pours the oil all over Jesus. And I think this is different to the occasion that we read about in Luke chapter 7. But I think it's the same occasion that we have in Matthew 26 and John 12. It was the custom in those days to to wash feet and indeed to anoint the head or the feet of a guest when they came to your home. Mary goes above and beyond. Mary breaks the neck on the jar in order to pour out all of its contents onto Jesus' head and his feet. The other guests know this perfume could have been sold for about a year's wages of a daily labourer. So you might say something around about £25,000 in today's money. That's why they're shocked. But it shows us what Jesus means to Mary. It shows us her total devotion. She holds back nothing. If she had just carefully peeled away the wax seal, she could indeed have used just a few drops. And then she could have put the jar back on the shelf for another occasion. She could have kept some of it for herself, but she didn't. She broke the neck of the jar. It can't be used for another purpose now. And you see, we can't give Jesus just a few little drops of our life. The right response is total devotion. Or you might think of the words complete sacrifice. Here Mary puts it all on the line. In the Old Testament, there were a number of sacrifices that the people would make at at different times. And one of them was known as the whole burnt offering. And as the name suggests, the whole of the animal is placed upon the altar and is burnt. And because the animal takes the place of the worshipper, 
It represents the giving of everything. It's the sacrifice, the surrender of my whole life to the Lord. And when the Apostle Paul writes his letter to the Romans, he says, in view of all the mercies that God has shown to us, present your bodies as living sacrifices. And I think he has in mind that whole burnt offering and speaks of the complete sacrifice of our life to the Lord in all of our daily activities. Mary sacrificed everything that she had. She gave it all up for the Lord. Are you willing to sacrifice your time, your abilities, your money, your possessions for the Lord? Mary was, and she did. Will you? Or perhaps we could use another phrase and talk about full consecration. In Exodus chapter 19, God's people have reached Mount Sinai and the Lord plans to establish his covenant with them. And therefore God speaks to Moses and said, the people must consecrate themselves. They must be ready. They must be prepared. And consecration is about being set apart for God. It's about belonging to God and it's living all of life to fulfill the purposes of God. And as we read on through the Old Testament, the priests were set apart. They were consecrated for the tasks of offering sacrifices and prayers to God for the people. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for his disciples. And in the middle of that prayer, he says, I sanctify myself for their sake. Now, Jesus does not mean that he is trying to make himself holy or pure. He is pure, sinless. But he is consecrating himself to do the Father's will. He is consecrating himself to give his life for his disciples, that they too may belong to God. Or perhaps we could sum up those three phrases, total devotion, complete sacrifice, full consecration, and say it's the cost of discipleship. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and then come and follow me. Now, that doesn't mean that we identify some difficult task or little problem in life and say, well, that's just the cross I have to bear. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus immediately adds, if you want to save your life in this world, then you'll lose it. But if you're willing to lose it for my sake, then you will find it. It's about the giving of ourselves totally to him. You see, it's free to become a believer in the Lord Jesus, to trust him as your Lord and Savior. But it costs everything to follow him and to be his disciple. And Paul reminds the church in Corinth of this. He says to them, you are not your own anymore. You belong to God. Therefore, honor God in everything. He's king. He's in charge. And so to break the jar is to accept the cost of being a disciple. Now, I, I, I'm not thinking here that the Lord is going to ask you to go to somewhere that you really don't want to go or, or do something that you're going to hate just as much. That idea has never really made any sense to me. But are you willing to give up a dream of yours in exchange for his dream for you? Are you ready to offer him each moment of each day, whatever you are and whatever you do? Are you willing to break a jar this morning? Breaking the jar is doing something that you have held back from doing because you're concerned about the cost of discipleship. And yet there are jars that need to be broken. 
We need to break open the jar of praise. He's the Lord of all. And yet he came into this world and he laid down his life for us. Therefore, we need to break open the jar of praise. We can't come and just praise with a few drops, a little bit half-hearted, depending how we're feeling. We have to come and praise him with all of our heart, with all that is within us. Not holding back. Breaking open that jar of praise. We need to break open the jar of prayer. We all agree that prayer is important. And yet somehow most of us struggle to find the time to pray. We have the great privilege to come before the throne of God's grace and find his help in all of our needs. Well, let me ask, would you trade an hour of your favorite program on television to enjoy an hour of prayer with others? Will you break open that jar of prayer? And then the jar of holiness. A few weeks ago, we looked at words in Esther 9 and saw that phrase that tables were turned. And we, we emphasized particularly tables turned in the fight against sin. Has anything changed in the last few weeks? And I ask that question not for you to feel guilty if it hasn't. But simply to say this. The thought of tables being turned perhaps emphasizes what God does. But the jar being broken emphasizes our responsibility and task. So if maybe nothing much has changed, maybe we need to break a jar or two. What jar will you break for greater holiness? But then there's also the need to break open the jar of service. If you like, the whole of life jar. Now, I, I, I'm not thinking here of uh, taking on yet something else in church life. I mean, for some of us, it might mean that we begin to, to do something. But I'm thinking of our daily service in everything on all of our front lines. I'm thinking of our service in our homes, with our families, in our work and down our streets. For here to break open the jar is to devote everything to the Lord. Now I don't think that Mary broke the jar on the spur of the moment without any thought or without considering the cost. I don't think the Bible asks us to act in that way and so I'm not going to ask you or press you or push you to do anything today without thinking about it but I am going to ask you to ask yourself the question what jar do I need to break secondly today let's move on and see that having broken the jar Mary poured out everything and allowed the fragrance to fill the room. And as we think of what it meant for Mary to pour out the oil, then let us ask ourselves the question, what are we willing to pour out to the Lord? To pour it out, it says to me that Mary gave herself fully. The fact that Mary honored Jesus in this way was not unusual. What was remarkable was what people thought of as the extravagance of her actions, breaking the jar and pouring out all this highly costly ointment. But when we pour out something, we, we don't hold back. When we pour out, we don't just offer a few little drops. You fill the cup. And Mary has this precious ointment in her jar. And with its long neck, she could have just offered a few little drops very carefully. And then put the jar back. 
She doesn't. She breaks the neck on the bottle and she pours out the ointment. This precious ointment. There are many things that are precious to us. Our time is precious. Our bank balance is precious. Our favourite TV programme is precious. Following our football team is precious. How in all of this do we give ourselves to the Lord? Do we give through the long neck of a jar that offers a few drops here and there? Or do we break the neck of the jar and give ourselves fully to the Lord? Of course, there are times when our work leaves us tired and drained emotionally as well as physically. Some of us have young children. Some of us have elderly parents, and they need us. And perhaps once we've paid the mortgage, the weekly food bill, and maintained the card and everything else, there's not exactly a lot left over. And so we're tempted to hold back, to give just a little, or maybe even to despair and feel that we don't have anything left to give at all. Well, first, let's remember again that there is nothing that we do that we don't offer to the Lord and do in his name. And so loving and helping our family Spending time with our children, meeting up with friends or just keeping in touch through these days, keeping an eye out for our neighbours and asking if they're okay, and all the many things that we do in our different workplaces, all of that we do in the name of Jesus. As though each action is for the Lord himself. And therefore every place and every moment is our front line for ministry. Don't let's think we don't have anything left at the end of the day. All of the activities of the day we have done for the Lord. See, every day, in everything that we do, we are ministers of God and of His grace to those around us. And as a church at High Road, we have more than a hundred full-time ministers of the grace of God. But also, let's remember that when it comes to church meetings and activities, that there are different periods of our lives when we have more or less time. Depending on the demands of our job, if we have children or elderly parents, Perhaps our own health. And at different stages, we have more or less money, and our ability to give is greater or less. That's the way of life. Let us simply be willing to give ourselves to the Lord in all that we are called to do day by day. And like Mary, let's make sure that we give ourselves willingly. I'm sure that Mary knew there would be shock. But she still breaks the jar and pours out all the ointment. I'm sure she knew that there would be whispers all round the room. But still she does it. She probably could have expected criticism. And yet she goes ahead. And she pours out all this oil willingly. Why? Simply because she is willing to do so. The Lord means everything to her. And she gives everything willingly and freely. It's what Peter writes to the churches in his first letter. And I don't think his words should be confined to to leaders. He says to them, serve not because you must, but because you're willing to. 
Not because you're forced to, not because you'll feel guilty if you don't, not because you think the pastor's going to come around and ask you why. Rather, serve because you're willing to. Willing because you've been seeing and listening to Jesus and you want to walk as he walked. Willing because you see the cross and know what he poured out for you. Willing because you know that he rose again in order to give you life and you want to live every moment for him. I think as Paul writes to the Romans, he encourages them to willingly use their gifts. And as I look at the list, I think some of them clearly, when the church gathers together, but also when the church is scattered all over the place in their daily lives. He says, if your gift is teaching, then you teach. If your gift is encouraging, then, then please do that. Encourage people because they need it. If your gift is serving, serve. If it's hospitality, then show hospitality. If it's contributing, then give generously. Whatever you are able to do, do that thing. And as I read those words, I hear Paul encouraging the church to willingly offer themselves to God. And as I read them, I see all kinds of ministers of grace who give themselves to the Lord willingly. In June last year, we began to think and pray about the shape of future ministry. We were hoping to get out of lockdown and, and return to some kind of normality. Well, we've had longer to think and to pray about these things. And quite clearly, some things we will continue to do as we have. Some things we need to do differently. But some things will be new. And in the next few weeks, we will begin to share about some new initiatives. And I would encourage you at this point, simply to be saying, Lord, is there a jar that I need to break so that I can be involved some way? Lord, how do you want me to pour out the oil of my life to you? In the coming weeks, we'll talk about YBBAMC. We'll explain that when we get to it. We'll think about friendship first, and initially a cafe online, but then in person to help people with their mental health. We'll talk about call and care, a possible partnership with green pastures, being Hong Kong friendly, a midweek, midday workers' service, a street party, Sunday in the park. Now, truth is, none of us, can be involved with all of those things. But equally, there is much more there than just half a dozen or even 16 or even 26 people can manage. Please join our church meeting and find out more about these things. Please join the Wednesday prayer times as we bring these initiatives before the Lord and see how you can be part of it. We're in this period that we call Lent, a few weeks leading up to Easter. And Lent's a good time for us to, to stop and take stock, to, to think, to pray, and uh, to review things, to review our walk with the Lord, to review our prayer life, to review our involvement in church life, and to review how we live every day as ministers of God's grace. Maybe there's a jar that you know that you need to break so that you can pour out the precious oil. Or maybe you need to start by trusting in Jesus as Lord and Savior if you've not done that. Maybe you've journeyed with us through the Gospel of Mark for a few weeks and you've watched Jesus and you've listened to Jesus, but is he your Lord and Savior? Have you said to him, I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong? Have you said to him, thank you for dying on the cross for me, that I may be forgiven? And have you started to trust him as Lord and Savior? If you want to take that step, please do get in touch with us through our website. But finally, let's see how 
it is that we become ministers of grace when we break the jar and we pour out the oil in every part of life. And it's in John's account where we note that the fragrance filled the house. When Moses hit the rock with his rod at God's instruction, he broke the rock and the water poured out. When Gideon's 300 men broke their large jars, it allowed their lamps to shine into the darkness. When Jesus began to break the loaves and the fish, 5,000 people were fed. And when Mary broke the jar and poured out the ointment, the fragrance filled. I want you to know this. When we're willing to break the jar, that is when we make that commitment. When we're ready to pour out the oil, that is we give ourselves fully and freely, it will bring blessing and hope and grace into the lives of those around us. In 1638, Dutch traders discovered Sri Lankan cinnamon. And one captain wrote in his log, the shores of the island are full of it, and it's the best in all the Orient. But here are the words I want us to note. When one is downwind of the island, one can still smell the cinnamon eight leagues out to sea. That's a little over 25 miles away. The fragrance carried over the waves long before the human eye could even see the shoreline. When we break the jar, when we pour out the oil before the Lord, then the fragrance of our life devoted to him, the fragrance of the oil poured out in praise, poured out in prayer, poured out in kind words, poured out in compassionate action. That fragrance is going to sweep through our homes. It's going to spread through our workplaces. It's going to refresh our church family. And it's going to run down our streets and into our community. Isn't that something worth living for? Moses was one of the great leaders of God's people. He led them out of slavery in Egypt. He brought them to Mount Sinai. He received God's covenant. Moses was a leader, a hero, a great man of God. How? Well, God's presence and God's power, of course. But notice also in the book of Hebrews, in the New Testament, we're told that Moses made a significant choice. Remember, he had been adopted by the Egyptian princess. But when he grew up and he looked around at all the wealth and all the pomp that was there in Egypt, the Bible says this. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. In other words, he broke the jar. It had been God's sovereign design that he grew up in the Egyptian court, that he would learn to read and to write and, and gain many leadership skills. But then God called him to lead his people. Moses might have stayed where he was. Moses might have just enjoyed the rich, the comfortable life, but he didn't. Moses broke the jar. He devoted himself to God. He made that sacrifice. He poured out his life in the service of God. And the fragrance of his life still spreads even today as we read his story. So what about you? For a few weeks, we have walked with Jesus. We've listened to his teaching. We've watched his way of life. And we've thought about walking as Jesus walked. But today, how will you respond to Jesus himself? Will you break that jar 
And will you pour out that oil? Moses did. Mary did. How about you? Let's then, let's come and bring our prayers. Heavenly Father, as we hear of Mary's devotion to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus, we recognise your commitment to us. Father, we know that to bring us back into your presence required the death of your Son required the separation of him from you for a period of time, required that he should suffer what we deserve to suffer. Father, as we think about something of your commitment to us, we recognise also that you are the giver of life. You are the God that has given us every day of our lives, have given us every opportunity within our lives, has given us the very breath that we breathe. And we want to say as we begin our prayers that we're sorry perhaps that too often our devotion has not been total. Too often our thoughts, our time, our money has been geared round what we want, not how you would have us live. Father, we have heard that indeed you walk every moment of our daily life with us. Help us to bring back those things that we do every day into your presence. Help us to do them to your glory, that our family life might be enriched, that our relationship with our work colleagues might be enriched, that we might begin to know the neighbours that we only just say good morning to. Father, you have given each and every one of us opportunities to show your love, to show what living as a Christian means. Help us to live our lives in a way that reflect your love, your care, your compassion. May it be that we become those ministers of grace, that we bless others, that we genuinely care about others, that we make choices that we know are those that would please you. Father, we come recognising that indeed you are the God of history, you are the God of time, you are a God that walks with us through every aspect of our life and so we come at this critical point and ask that you walk with us as we begin to open our schools up again grant teachers and parents wisdom as to what to do how to do it in a safe way may it be that we balance both health and education and a real longing for the best for our children. May it be that that guides and guards our decisions. And Father, what we pray for our schools, we pray for our care homes. We recognise the real anxiety at opening the door and risking the possibility of bringing COVID back into such a place. But Father, we also know how lonely life is without the family, how difficult it is when you feel that you have been abandoned or 
that you are alone in your circumstances. Father, we would pray that as care homes beginning to begin to open up again, you give the staff wisdom and guidance that indeed we may do things in a way which help balance the real demands that we are facing in this day. Father, we would pray for our government and our local councils. We recognise that to give the public good advice at this moment in time is difficult. The circumstances are changing. We've not trod this path before. We need your guidance. We need your leading. Father, we recognise that you have withheld nothing with your love for us. May it be that we withhold nothing in our love for you. May it be that we recognise your worthiness and bring our worship. May it be that we recognise your care for our world and we bring our prayers. May it be that we recognise your holiness and we seek to emulate that, to do that which would be good in your sight. And so, Father, we bring every aspect of our life, every aspect of our world to you at this moment in time, recognising that we are about to go into a period of exploration, unknown, ones with enormous consequences for people live and die by the decisions that we are making at this moment in time. But we bring them to you. We ask that you indeed guide, guard, bring wisdom, that you indeed will keep in the forefront of our minds that that we do we do to the glory of God and your honour. Amen.